Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I wanted to do some studies outside, but we have a fire in the, in the area. Not this area, but Northern California to Oregon. We've had fires and some of the smoke is coming over our direction. Sometimes the Lord blesses us and blows it back inland. Sometimes this morning I woke up with all my windows open because that's my AC at night. Open up all the windows, get as cold in here as possible, close all the windows. It'll stay cool all the way through the, to the afternoon. But I woke up this morning and could smell smoke in the house. Um, so, had some smoke and everything. That being said, keep praying for me, brother, says Christ. I'm praying for you. But let's get into the study. I want to name it the, the quickest, uh, I want to name it something along the lines of the fastest Bible studies in the, to do in the world. The quickest, fastest Bible studies you can do in the world. But the Lord put it on my heart and said, well, you're mainly going to be talking about this, the indoctrination of yea hath God said. So that's what we're going to go ahead and title it, the indoctrination of yea, God said. But we're going to start this out by, hey, we're going to do some studies and see how fast it takes to do these studies. Okay. First one we're going to do is we're going to do a study on free grace. So I type in free grace, those exact words, nowhere to be found. i got the sword searcher open over here. Nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. I mean, if we studied on the word free... Free is mentioned 58 times. Right? Um, it says 58 verses found, 59 match matches. But uh, free is there. And of course, if you type in grace, and you know your Bible, you type in grace, let me move this over a little bit. It's 159 verses, 170 matches. But the moment you type in free grace, No matches. Now, when you have it for search for any word, it'll come up with Romans 5.15, but not as the offense, so as also as the free gift. A gift that comes to me is free on my side, but it costs God something. Salvation costs something. People always say, salvation is free. It's free. It costs something. It costs God, His Son, on the cross at Calvary. To me, the gift is free, but the but this is Christ. Be careful of the so-called free grace movement. I'm just going to sum it up real quick. The free grace movement is this. This is supposed to be a gift. Let's say I buy this Bible for somebody. Until I hand it to that person, it's still mine. This book is mine until I hand it to them and give it to them, and it's a gift. They didn't, to them it's free, but to me it costs money to buy this book, but to them it's free. The whole point of it being, they're getting away from that we are saved by God's grace, and that it's a gift of God. They're getting away from saying it's a gift. Why? Because a gift has to be given. If they say free grace, the whole movement of the free grace movement is I can just take salvation. Well, did you repent? Oh, I don't hate, repentance is, I don't want to repent. I love my sin. I love my worldliness. I don't want to repent. So they take repentance out. Did you, did you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is not possible if you kick repentance out. It's not possible. No, we, we just have the head knowledge of what Jesus did and why he did it. Did you confess both in prayer and ask God to save you? Oh, no, that's works. No, we didn't do that either. So what they're doing is this whole movement, what they call easy believism, chapter and verse where it says easy believism. This whole movement is just so they can take salvation without God giving it to them. They can just take it. It doesn't work that way. It never works that way. So free grace, two seconds, we're done. Why? Because it's not in the Bible. What about faith alone? Zero. Not in the Bible at all. Now, if, like once again, if you do exact match, zero. When you do say the search for the words, James 2.17 comes up that says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, not to try to go into this because that's not the study, but I'm learning that in James, there's some brethren that get mixed up. Paul teaches that we today we're justified by faith. Remember, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not by faith. You have to go through faith. It's still God's grace that saves. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
For we are created in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. The changed life after salvation. That's another reason why they hate repentance. They don't want the changed life. They love their wicked, sinful life. They have no problem with sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. They just want a free pass to heaven. But faith alone, um, Paul teaches that we're justified by faith. But in the book of James, James teaches that you're justified by works and there's faith on the side. Paul teaches you're justified by faith and there's works on the side that prove your faith. That prove that you're truly saved. We did a whole series of studies on this. Proving Yourselves. Two-part series. If you haven't watched it, please go watch it. All right? And they both use Abraham as an example. So Abraham wasn't just justified by faith. Abraham was only justified by faith. That's wrong. Abraham was justified by his faith. Abraham was justified by his works. Because James says Abraham was justified by his works. And he uses his uh, willing to sacrifice his son Isaac when he's commanded to do it. As an example of being justified by works. And Paul uses Abraham's justification of faith that he believed God. Okay? And it was counted to him for righteousness. But once again, faith alone. Faith alone. Chapter and verse. Easiest, quickest study. It's not biblical. Stop saying it. Free grace. It's not biblical. Stop saying it. Triune God. I got into this with somebody. Well, well, we, we worship a triune God. Okay, let's let's triune. Gotta spell it right though. Triune God. Nowhere in scripture. Some people say, well, you're getting a little picky there. Nowhere in scripture. But you'll hear people say it left and right. I worship. Tri I don't worship a triune God. I worship God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. I worship the Godhead. The Godhead is Jesus Christ. First it was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then it becomes just baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus, in Him, dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You have God the Father in Him the soul. You have the Holy Spirit in Him the Spirit, and He's the body. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. All you have to do is be baptized by Jesus Christ to get saved today. Whole other issue there. But the thing is, is people say try and go. It's not in the Bible. Stop saying it. All this stuff, more than anything, is used to promote false teachings, false gospels, false teachings. It's meant to go against this book. Okay? Trinity. I know we've done this before. Trinity. Nowhere to be found. God the Son. How many people have heard that said before? God the Son. Zero. Nowhere to be found. Okay, that study was done really quick and easy. Like I told you, the quickest studies in the world. Not in the Bible. How about God the Holy Spirit? Now remember the Bible says God is a spirit, the spirit of God. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, he's called the capital S Son of God, showing that he's God the Father, manifest in the flesh. He's the body of God. He's the image of God. He's the person of God. He's the flesh of God. He, God came in the likeness of sinful flesh. The Bible says one of Jesus' titles is Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel? God with us. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's only but one capital G, God the Father. So it's God the Father with us, manifest in the flesh. But he's called the capital S Son of God, and he's also called the capital S Son of Man when it comes to his family line back to King David, showing that he's the King of the Jews. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's their King. He's never called God the Son. God, the Son, I don't want to go off this too much, but the is definitive. It separates the Son from the Father and makes him his own lowercase g God, separates himself from the Father. When you say God, the Son. When you say capital S Son, of, of shows connection. Now are we the sons of God? We're connected to God. Now I'm not saying I'm God, but I'm saying we're connected. There's a connection there, of He's the capitalist son of God. 
Jesus Christ, apart from the Father, is not God. And that's what the Trinity teaches, that God the Son is not God the Father. It separates them. He can't be God if he's, if he's not the Father manifest in the flesh. If He's not the body of God, the image of God, the person of God. But if we're being serious, capital T Trinity, not there. God the Son, not there. God the Holy. How about God in three persons? That's a big push there. They always push that. God in three persons. Nowhere. Nowhere. I, I know we've got this right. What about rapture? Rapture. Nowhere. I'll, I'll do another one. Second Advent. Someone, was, a sister in Christ was asking me about the Second Advent. Uh, which the Bible calls the Day of Vengeance. It probably calls it a couple other things, but it's the Day of Vengeance. But the Second Advent. Some people say, the Second Advent. Well, chapter and verse on Second Advent not there. Now, I could keep going. There's a lot of things. Church age. Um, uh, uh, they call it pre-trib rapture. I could throw out... There's a, we call it pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, but I'm starting to steer away from that. I still say it sometimes, but because the time of Jacob's trouble is biblical. There's a catching up, caught up, come up hither. Uh, John was caught up. Jesus was caught up. We're going to be caught up the same way Jesus was. Uh, I believe, but the time, the the for that event when we get caught up, it's called the day of Christ, the blessed hope, the day of redemption. That's what it's actually called. But you say, brother, you've been going through all these words. Fastest study you can ever do. What's what's your point? I don't see you because these people that really aren't Bible believers will be like, I don't see your point, brother. I don't see your. I, they won't even call me brother. You're a heretic. You're a heretic. Um, I don't get your point. You just not make the point is is either this is perfect just the way it is, or it needs to be corrected and improved. Corrected or improved. Which is it? These guys that use all these terms, I'm kicking everybody. I'm going to be kicking me too here in a bit. Anytime we catch ourselves saying something and saying, "Thus saith the Lord," is it in here? Is it in the Bible? Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we read, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, you which you heard of us, you receive it not as the words of men. Because it, when you have the attitude of, Yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be, oh, we can improve on what God said, we can say it better, oh, God made a mistake, and we're just trying to quietly sweep that mistake under the rug and correct him and everything by saying things our way. You're treating it as if it's the words of men. The words of men can be wrong. The words of men need correction. There's times where I've opened my mouth and inserted foot. How many of you, brothers and sisters Christ, have had those days where you slipped up and said something wrong and didn't say something right? You needed to be corrected. But God's Word... You received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. In Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 6, it reads, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. This book is perfect just the way it is. The King James Bible is perfect just the way it is. And I get frustrated because you have a lot of these, uh, I call them, the Bible calls them false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing. But there's times where I call them snakes because they like to slither in. And next thing you know, they're standing right among us saying, Hey, I'm one of you. I'm a Bible believer. I believe this book is perfect. Free grace. Wait a minute. I thought you just said this book was perfect. Oh, yeah, I believe this is perfect. Faith alone. Wait, wait, wait. You said this book was perfect the way it is. Oh, yeah, it is perfect the way it is. Trying God. Trinity, Rapture, Second Advent, Church Age, Millennial Kingdom. Where are all this stuff in here? What happened to you being a Bible believer and believing this book is perfect? Now, be a, please understand, I put Peter Ruckman's studies up here because he's got some good studies, but Peter Ruckman had a serious problem, and we're going to get into it. 
And one of the problems he had is on one hand, when it came to the Bible perversionists, why he's, when he's standing for this book being God's perfect written word, it's perfect. He would quote that verse, Proverbs 36, Add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. But then when he started using a lot of these terms and titles and words, like the, the, they're just descriptions. No, they're words to replace the words that God chose. And when he got called out for it, you know what his excuse was? Oh, there's words that we, there's lots of words we don't use that are in the Bible. Well, believe it or not, there's millions of words I use that are in the Bible. Truck, automobile, computer, you know. There's a lot of words we use that aren't in the Bible. That's not the point, and he knows it. Well, he knows it more now because I believe he's saved. He's in heaven. But he knows better now, but he knew better then, too. There's a difference between me just using words that's the English language, and we turn around saying, thus saith the Lord, and it's not in here. This is Bible doctrine, and it's not in here. The Bible teaches, the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures say, and you start using the words like free grace, faith alone, triune God, trinity, rapture, second advent, church age, uh, millennial kingdom, and so on, and so on, and so on. There's a difference. Brother says Christ, if you can't see a difference, your heart's not right with the Lord. We're not supposed to be adding to this book. When I sit down and say, okay, uh, right now we're talking about indoctrination. We're going to get into what the Bible word is for what's, what, what's talking about. But a lot of people understand the indoctrination. I'm going to explain the indoctrination. But the Bible word that it uses is spoiled. In other words, you're becoming rotten. When you start turning on this book and you think you can add to this book or subtract from this book, when you start thinking you can do things your way instead of God's way, you start out small where you start becoming spoiled. And the next thing you know, you become reprobate. You become rotten. You become worthless. If you're saved, you become worthless as a Christian. If you're a fake and you're a fraud, well then you are worthless to begin with. I used to be worthless to begin with until I truly got saved and born again. We have been indoctrinated into saying things that are not in the Bible. And I'm kicking me too, because I'm going to use the example that came up recently. But we've been indoctrinated into saying things that aren't in the Bible. Even I have been programmed. I know I'm, like I said, we'll get into the Bible, what the Bible says. Even I've been programmed to say things the world's way, and the Lord is having to, the Lord's having to deprogram me. He's having to get me back on the right path. He's got to get me back to saying, thus saith the Lord, and it's actually in here. Being a Berean. When someone says, this is Bible doctrine, Trinity, this is fundamental Bible doctrine, the Trinity. The Bereans said, okay, we're going to search the scriptures to see if those things are so. The word Trinity is nowhere to be found. You're a liar. And you are. And I was. I used the word Trinity back when I was newly saved. I was. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay. Now, the biggest example of me that just happened recently was is I was getting frustrated with a brother in Christ, and I'll use his name, Brother Brian. I was watching one of his old studies. What did John um, teach uh, isolation, or preach isolation, before the catching up? All right. Now, first and foremost, he never taught. He never landed with that whole title. He never landed, you know, because John never preached once isolation before the catching up. He grabbed a lot of verses. He made a lot of good points with the Bible about you know you have to break fellowship with people. That's it's going to lower the amount of people that you you get to hang out. With. You're not supposed to hang out with the lost world when it comes to fellowshipping. I, you can help your neighbors. I help my lost neighbors all the time. Uh, I'm house. I'm dog sitting right now for one of my lost neighbors that I've witnessed to. I've even given them. I've said this before. I've given them my gospel tracts and booklets and everything. You can still help brethren, uh, lost people out. You're just not supposed to fellowship with them, and you're not supposed to indulge, like hang out with them in their sin. Okay. But he made a very good points. But one of the things he made in there was that John is isolated in the island of Patmos. And he kept saying, exiled, and he kept saying, isolated. John's exiled to the island of Patmos. John's isolated in the island of Patmos. And I was talking to a brother in Christ in fellowship, and I was like, it just, it, am I the only one? 
that this does does this bother just me? Not just because it's Brian. I believe he's saved. I believe he's lost his way. I really do. But is am I the only one that I'm getting to the point when you hear people say, "Thus saith the Lord." This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches. And you're like, and you realize that the Bible doesn't actually say that. And I got into this brother, and I said. The isolation, the Bible, it never once says that John was isolated. He's exiled to the island of Patmos. He's not isolated. He could have been with people. He could have led sold, uh, other prisoners to Christ or some of the soldiers to Christ. And I started getting in my whole spiel, of, uh, like how did the uh, book, the, the book of, uh, oh gosh, my brain, forgive me, brothers, Revelation, how the book of Revelation gets off the island and stuff like that. And I think after the whole conversation, the brother in Christ didn't say much. And then I got a, a message back, and the brother in Christ said, Hey, I went and watched the study too. And as I was reading and following along, you know, it doesn't actually say he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And I froze. So you get your book out real quick. You get your book out, and you go, Wait a minute, wait a minute. I have been saying ex John was exiled to the island of Patmos since I was saved. So we get over here, we get, we get to going really fast, and it says, uh, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and comp companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Wait a minute, where does it say he was exiled to the island of Patmos? It doesn't. Where does it say he was isolated? It doesn't. I remember looking online, they have all these stories that are just fables, 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 fables. Well, the island, they just drop them off, and you got to go fend for yourself, and you got all these people, and they just have stories after stories. But what does the Bible actually say? It just says he was there. And notice the key word is was. This is a little side note. Brian Denlinger believes that John was caught up fully and completely. Where does it say he came back right there? When he's putting this together in a letter form to send out to the, to the churches, it says he was, that's past tense, in the isle that is called Patmos. It's past tense. So he's saying when he's going to go in through this whole story, everything he wrote down at the time, he's putting, which is like a letter form. you got information you want to send to someone so you can copy and paste the information, but you put what's called, what's it called in a book? A preface. In a book, you put a preface to kind of explain why you're sending this information. Why you wrote this book. Why you're sending this information. Chapter 1 is, is John writing after he's outside of Patmos. He's no longer in Patmos. I was. It says was. That's past tense. And the island is called Patmos. Plus, John never got caught up fully and completely. Once again, we got to read what the scriptures actually say and stop adding to the word of God. It says John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And then it says John was caught up in the Spirit. His body and soul were still here. It's a whole little side disagreement I have with Brother Brian. But the biggest thing is, is I was getting frustrated with him because he kept saying it like if you repeat it enough times, you can get people to believe that's what the Bible's actually saying. They're isolated. They're isolated. He said he's isolated. He's isolated. But it doesn't say that. And I got mad and said, it's, he's exiled, but he doesn't mean he's isolated. And I had a brother in Christ hit me up and say, hey brother, where does it say exile? And it was just a smack across my face that, hey, the same problem he has, I have the same problem. But this is Christ, I bet you you have the same problem. Peter Ruckman had the same problem. David Daniels has the same problem. Sam Gipp has the same problem. Um, their, their book has the same problem. I have the same problem. What is that? We've been indoctrinated, and there's some things that we're saying that don't come from the Scriptures. We're saying, thus saith the Lord, and when we actually look, we realize we were indoctrinated. All these years, we were indoctrinated. There's things that we say that have no basis in Scripture. John was not exiled. It doesn't say John was exiled to the island of Patmos. It doesn't say he was isolated on the island of Patmos. It never says that he got caught up fully and completely and never came back. Because the, the Bible's against that. I just proved it. it. says he was. When he's writing and putting this all together to send out to the churches, that first chapter, which I believe is like a preface, a letter to the reader that's going to be reading everything afterwards, 
He's no longer in the island of Patmos. He was. It's past tense. When he's writing this, he's no longer in the island of Patmos. But we've got to be careful. We're being indoctrinated. Okay? Where do we get this indoctrination from? Where did this indoctrination very, very first start? Turn to Genesis. If you know the story, turn to Genesis. Where did this indoctrination start? Where we start adding to God's word and subtracting from God's word. We start saying things our way and doing things our way. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Every time you say free grace, faith alone, triune God, trinity, rapture, second advent, church age, millennial kingdom, pre-trib rapture, the great tribulation for that seven year time period, you're saying, yea, hath God said. We can say it better. Either God made a mistake and we're correcting him, or God said it just fine, but we can improve on how God said it, and the way we say it is better than the way God said it. It's the yea hath God said disease. All right? Yea hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the gardens, of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Touch it? Did God ever say you couldn't touch it? Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So first he said, Yea, hath God said. Then he just flat out calls God a liar. When God said it's the Godhead, and you say, No, Trinity, you're calling God a liar. God, you lied to us. It's not the Godhead, it's the Trinity. And we've done some studies, brothers, this Christ that the whole point is, is the enemy comes in and it's, it's Godhead, it's Godhead, it's Godhead. Then it's Godhead, it's very rarely called the Trinity. Then after a while longer, it's Godhead or the Trinity, also known as the Trinity. Then it gets switched around. Now people stop saying Godhead first, they start saying Trinity first. Also known as the Godhead. No, no, it's not also known as the, it's called the Godhead, but now it's Trinity, also known the God, as the Godhead. Then it's Trinity, and, very, and then very rarely do they say, well, also known as the Godhead. Now it's just Trinity. You see how that works? Why aren't the brethren jumping up going chapter and verse on capital T, Trinity is a title for God. Chapter and verse on lowercase t, Trinity is a description of God. Why are we acting like Bereans when it comes to any of this stuff, this garbage that's being spouted by the lost world? All right. he just, he's called God a liar. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and, she, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The part there where it says ye shall be as gods, he's saying you get to decide what's good and evil. You get to be the boss. You can say, you can decide what's the best way to say things. We don't need this book to say it. I can say it however I want to say it. That's the indoctrination here. Okay. Where is that indoctrination now? That's where it started, in the Garden of Eden. Where is it now? In the Babel buildings. Organized religion. Video platforms. YouTube channels. Where is it at? It's been, the body of Christ has been infested with, it's okay to add to scriptures in certain areas. Well, there's lots of words, like Peter Ruckman, there's lots of words we use that aren't in the Bible. Nice try there, brother, but you're not getting off that easy. You say, thus saith the Lord, it better be in there. Or you're a liar. That goes for me too. I lied. Not intentionally, I lied. I, for some reason, I've heard it said a million times. Like I said, the indoctrination, if you say it, oh, I, there's people saying, John was isolated on the island of Patmos. Well, how do you know that? Because I watched that Brian, Brother Brian study on, did John prof, preach isolation? And he said it a million times. I'm exaggerating, but he said it so many times in that video. 
Um, if you don't know these names, in other words, there's brethren that are doing teachings where they're saying something over and 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 over. And over. Indoctrination. And it's not in the scriptures. I've heard that so many times. Exiled to the island of Patmos. Exiled to the island of Patmos. It doesn't say he was exiled to the island of Patmos. It just says he was there. Past tense. And why was he there? For the testimony of Jesus Christ and his word. I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it open right now. But In other words, he could have been there just... God called him to that island to witness to the people on that island. He could have gotten in trouble and you've got to go spend 30 days in prison. He's got to spend a term in prison. It could have been a prison island. It could have. But the Bible doesn't say exactly what it is. It just says that he was there. And he was there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel. That's all it says. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. We read, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in Him. When you get saved and born again, your walk, you have a new life and a new goal in life. Looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Being a living witness and a verbal witness. Fearing God, seeking out His Word. King James Bible. I did the Bible version issue study. That always bothers me when you get... i, I got to be patient because a lot of people aren't where I was. Or am. But... They're not even where I was when I first got saved. I just had such a... I did the Bible version issue study, hardcore, every aspect. Okay, this is God's Word. There's some people that haven't done the study at all. But you deal with people that... They, have, they don't believe this book is perfect. Okay? But you remember, to be in Christ Jesus, you have to... Uh, wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God. The middle of wisdom is seeking out God's Word and what pleases God, God's way, which is His Word. Then the third part is hiding in your heart and living it, keeping His commandments, taking God's Word. Remember that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You start living His Word. Then you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ to this lost world. You're supposed to be a light for Jesus Christ to this lost world with the life that you're living. You're supposed to be separate from this. This world is walking in darkness as a false convert, part of easy believism, repentantless gospel, I was blending in with the darkness because I was walking in darkness. I wasn't saved. When you get saved, you're not supposed to be walking in darkness. You're not supposed to be carnally minded walking after the flesh. You're now spiritually minded, capital S spirit, she minded, and walking after the spirit. So walk ye in him. You have the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says sanctification. So you have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. You're supposed to be holier than the lost world. You're supposed to be living right in God's eyes. Getting all the sin out. Getting all the idolatry out. The covetousness out. The lust of the flesh out. Okay, So walk ye in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. The Bible says, Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I think that's in James. Okay. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You're dead and buried with Christ. The new man is raised with Christ. And the new man, this is your foundation, the Word of God. He's the boss. Jesus is the head of the corner. He's the foundation. His Word is the foundation. Built up in Him and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving... And here comes the warning. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. A lot of brethren sometimes get caught up in philosophy. Now, here's, here's something I was told. It's kind of like it's philosophy. When it's, when it's, um, I, I, here's a philosophical statement. This book will keep me from my sins, or my sins will keep me from this book. How many of you heard that? I've heard that. But what does the Bible actually say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you're sinning against him, it's because his word is not in your heart. When I, when I was newly saved and trying to get sin out of my life, sanctification, anytime I gave in to temptation and chose to get back into sin that I gave up for the Lord, it kept me from this book. 
It kept me from reading the book. It kept me from prayer. It hindered my walk with the Lord. We need to get back to the Bible. Okay? There's nothing wrong with saying a little bit of a phrase as long as you back it up with Scripture, what, what the Word actually says. But I know brethren that say a lot of um, phil philosophical sayings, and they'll say there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. And they don't quote an ounce of Scripture to back it up. You know what? There's absolute truth in this, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what we're supposed to be exhorting the brethren with. This is what we're supposed to be correcting the brethren. You have someone come up to me saying, Oh no, free grace is truth. They can't correct me through the Scriptures because free grace isn't in the Scriptures. Faith alone isn't in the Scriptures. I can go down to the whole list again. This is how we're supposed to correct people. And what they're doing is getting you away from this and start correcting people with this. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. They don't want this to be the final authority. They want man to be the final authority. We read that up there. You know, you received it not as the words of men. They want you to treat it like it's the words of men. And there's brethren, and I'm, we're all infected with this disease. We're spoiled through philosophy. And here it is, in vain deceit, after the traditions of men after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I say it again, where's this, uh, yea hath God said? It started in the garden. Where's it now? In the battle building system. It's on YouTube video, plat like video platforms. It start to infect the body of Christ. How many times have you, I, this is just this situation with John being exiled, this isn't the first time a brother in Christ in the last several years. I've, I've been, after 10 years, God is still working on me. After 10 years, I'm finding that there's still some things I'm saying that the Bible ain't saying. And I have to step back and go, Lord, where did I get that then? From your lost life in the Babel building system? From some of these brethren online that came out of the Babel building system? Some are still in the Babel building system? I call them Babel buildings. They call them church buildings, but they're Babel buildings. Okay. God's still working on me after 10 years, brother says Christ. You think I'm just pointing the finger at everybody? It's the first person I'm kicking is this man right here. I'm working so hard and I'm trying to encourage you, brother says Christ, to start your day with the Word of God and end your day with the Word of God. Start your day with prayer in the Word of God and end your day with prayer in the Word of God. Know this book and do your best to make sure that you rightly divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15, but that you know this book so when someone comes along and says, hey, I, I like to believe I know this book, not fully yet, I'm still working on it, Brother Christ, but I know it a lot. And I still have some work to do. I still have work to do. I still failed. I still made mistakes. It's what the Bible says that matters. After 10 years, God is still working on me. I'm still, to this day, getting corrected from brethren. Praise God. I, I want the correction when it, 100%, if I say something. I remember telling the story about King David, uh, Samuel going to anoint King David. Um, that uh, his, brother, his father, Jesse, not brother, father, Jesse, he came out and met him in the field and everything. And I was thinking of some other story somehow, and I was, I was crossing my stories. But regardless, I'm not trying to make an excuse for it, I was wrong. I had a brother in Christ say, well, it says that he came to the town there, and he met with the elders, and then he had to invite Jesse there. And I said, Jesse asked him, comest thou peacefully? No, it was the elders that asked him, comest thou peacefully? He says peacefully. The point I was trying to push is that when you saw a prophet come to your town, you got scared. But the whole point is, is there's times where I don't say the story 100% right, when I'm trying to do it from memory, and I may say, I have no problem with correction. Correct me. I know there was a brother that he would, he would butcher verses that God blessed me with memorizing. Brother says, Christ, if you've never watched my testimony, please go watch my testimony. I had a, a major heat stroke when I was in the military, and it turned into seizure disorders. And I was having three seizures a month for almost nine years. I think by the ninth year, I, 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 I was, it got down to one seizure a month, and then by that ninth year, I was able to get almost a year free of seizures. And it's not easy for me to retain things. 
Now, I play video, my addictions, video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, when it's visual, the mind can just grab that visual and it can stick with you for the rest of your life. Even if you saw that visual thing once, it just, it's burned in your brain. But when it comes to reading and words and stuff, it's not easy for me to memorize stuff. So when he would say a verse that I knew, this brother in Christ, I'd quote the verse to him and he'd get upset. It's like you're crazy. Uh, no, I'm just quoting what the word says. I, part of me is excited that I, I can memorize. But the other thing is, is it helps me make sure I'm saying it right. That brother got a little prideful. Well, how do you correct me? Why don't you actually quote the scriptures properly, brother? Why don't you spend more time in the scriptures? Instead of on this garbage here, in the world garbage. Why don't you spend more time in the scriptures? Brother says, Christ, I don't mind correction. If I say something wrong, correct me, please. I want to make sure that when I say, thus saith the Lord, it's actually in here. Now, I understand there's people that disagree with how I use the scriptures. By all means, come talk to me. But bottom line, I'm sticking with this book. The, here's, here's my saying, Brother says, Christ, rule number one, God's word is always right. Rule number two, if Philip Newton is wrong, refer to rule number one. This book is always right. And I need to line up with this book, especially when I say, thus saith the Lord. Okay. But I, to this day, I'm still getting corrected from brethren, sometimes out of love, and sometimes out of spite, bitterness, envy, the Bible talks about. In other words, some with good intentions and others with bad. They just want to point out my mistakes. Okay. Mainly, false converts love to pounce on my mistakes. I've actually gotten correction from people I believe are absolutely lost because I said something wrong or read something wrong and they, they pounced on it and I took the correction. Not because I believe they're saved. No, but if I screwed up, I screwed up. Do I not? I don't like it <laughs> when people that are false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing correct me. I don't. I don't. But it reminds me of Philippians 1.15. Philippians 1.15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. Sometimes they, they, they wait for me to make a mistake, an actual mistake, and they pounce. And they think, well, ha ha, I can cause division. Oh, ha, I can make them look bad. No, I'll take the correction. They, they, they're trying to add afflictions to my bonds, not, sin, not sincerity. But the, uh, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Now, I understand this is called pre preaching Jesus, but it also has to do with preaching the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the light of the world. There's one meaning between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Brothers of Christ... I don't mind the correction, regardless where it comes from, as long as, you know, you said this, but where's it? I've had brothers say, where does that say that? They're nice. They're kind. They just say, hey, brother, you said this in one of your studies. I couldn't find it. Where is that at in the Bible? And there's been times where I showed it to them, and they're like, oh, okay, thank you. They want a the truth. They're not there to try to just, you know, hatchet job and stab me in the back or anything like that. But then there's some that I went to look for it, and I couldn't find it because it wasn't in there. I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a brother in Christ hit me up and say, uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he's never called an antichrist. So you've got to be careful saying the Bible calls him an antichrist because it never calls him an antichrist. And I looked through the Bible and I couldn't find it. And I said, okay, brother, I took the correction. I said, okay, brother, I'll take the correction. And I even kind of said it a couple times in a couple videos and took the correction, publicly took the correction. And then later on down the road, as God oftentimes works, when you pray to God, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally, and braideth not, and it shall be given to him. When you pray, hey, Lord, open the scripture, show me the truth. I think about a month later, I came across 1 John, where it talks about um, that, man, the, uh, it's that antichrist that shall come. But even now, there are many antichrists. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Please forgive me. But he talks about there's an antichrist that shall come. He's talking about a specific antichrist that shall come. And I'm like, he's talking about the, the man of sin, the son of perdition. 
And when I got back with this brother, you think he'd be like, like I took the correction, you think he'd take the correction. Well, it's not really saying about this. Oh, blah, blah. He had excuses because he couldn't, his pride and his ego couldn't let him say, okay, I was wrong. It does call the man of sin, the son of perdition, an antichrist. There's an antichrist, a specific antichrist that shall come. What's the antichrist that comes after we leave? I mean, that's in the future, after the body of Christ leaves. The man of sin, the son of perdition. There's some brethren that they just have the hardest time taking correction. And like I said, the hardest correction you're ever going to take, brothers and Christ, is when the lost world is pointing out your mistake, when you know you're wrong, and it's hard to, because of who it's coming from. Okay. The point is, when you're wrong, you still need to owe up to it, regardless who's telling you. Now, God can use lost people. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar is a lost heathen man that's burning in hell right now. He was worshipped as a god. He worshipped false gods. He just acknowledged the Lord Most High. But that wasn't salvation back then. You had to be circumcised, keep the laws of Moses, the ordinances. You had to do animal sacrifices without the shedding of blood. There can be no remission of sins. That man wasn't saved. That man's in hell right now. But God used him for his glory. God can use anybody to, to get me back on the right path. I've been corrected by the lost people. They're the hardest ones to take correction from. Uh, brethren, the second one I'd say, the second group of people that's the hardest ones to take correction from is brethren that get so prideful and puffed up. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And they don't come to you correcting you because they love you. They come to correct you because they're seeking you to look bad so they can look good. But if they're right, when you are wrong, you still need to owe up to it. Take the correction, fix the problem, and move on. We've been talking about proving your own selves, that you're actually belonging to God. One of the proofs that you belong to God is if any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. This is Jesus Christ speaking, following Jesus. You take the correction, you fix the problem, and you move on. These people, when you call them out saying, hey, you're saying all these terms and, and, and titles, that they're nowhere in Scripture, they won't take the correction, they won't fix the problem. They don't think they have a problem. Yea, hath God said, I don't care, I don't have a problem. Peter Ruckman, he kind of had that attitude too. I don't have a problem. There's nothing wrong with saying Trinity. There's nothing wrong with saying God in three persons. There's nothing wrong with saying God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with saying Church Age. There's nothing wrong with saying Millennial Kingdom. And so on, and so on. When you are proven that what you're saying is not in Scripture, you need to line up with, this, with the Word of God. What gets in the way of this? Well, I already talked about it. Uh, three things. Pr pride is in both these two. So I'll say two things, and pride is part of both of them. One is the lust of the flesh. The Bible says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The Bible also says, this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Never, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. You know what keeps brethren from taking correction when they start let, getting into the flesh, the lust of the flesh, start making provision for the flesh. They start, they don't like you calling out their sin. And their heart starts hardening. But, and it becomes pride. So, they, you know, who are you to judge me? A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. I don't know if you know the, all those excuses. It all depends on how you look at it. That's just your interpretation. I had a brother in Christ that turned his back on the order of authority in the Bible that God sets for us. God, through his son Jesus Christ, man, woman, child, and I threw animals at the bottom because the Bible says that mankind is over the animals. Um, he went against the order of the Bible, and we had talked so many times about all these people that turn their back on, on, the, tr on you know, the true gospel, that now I'm hearing he's turned his back on the true gospel. Um, all these different teachings were, they, their biggest comeback is that's just your interpretation. He quote the scripture to me, no scriptures of any private interpretation. And when I started showing the scriptures on the order of authority that he, he used to believe in and he's turning his back on, you know what he said to me? 
Well, that's just your interpretation. And then he, I think he froze after he said it and realized what he had said. He typed it. He didn't say it. He typed it. And then I quote, I typed that verse, I copied and pasted that verse and threw it back at him. Oh, well, yeah, that's you doing it, though. That's you doing it. And he's trying to throw pride. Lust of the flesh. I, I'm not going to get into too much with him, but I believe he's doing it for his wife. His wife is, is not a Christian. His wife is a Jezebel. And he's trying to please his wife. His wife wants to be a preacher, a teacher, and all, an evangelist, and all the, the offices that God sets for men. She doesn't want to stay in the boundaries that God set for her. Whole other situation. But the point is, is he slipped up and started using those excuses. I know a brother in Christ that was vehemently defending Christmas. I got a video of him where he's using every excuse on those lines to justify Christmas. A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. Oh, you know, uh, who are you to judge me? I have liberty. Who are you to judge me? It all depends on how you look at it. That's just your interpretation. He used every excuse in the book. Not to follow this book, man's book, the world's book, Remember word, the words of men, philosophy. He was using everything in you know the wisdom of this world instead of the wisdom of God to justify Christmas, his holiday. Right? The, once again, I'll say again. The point is, when you're wrong, you still need to owe up to it. Take the correction, fix the problem, and move on. What gets in the way of this? You don't have to turn here. I'm going to go through them really fast. Proverbs eleven two. When pride cometh. Then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Remember the Bible talks about people who glory in their shame? When I get told I did something wrong, my head hangs down low, I'm like, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, where did I get that? Why, did I, why do I say John was exiled to that? You, have your, your, you don't glory in your shame. You have sorrow in your shame. And you come to God to get it fixed. But when you're pride, when you get into pr pride, that shame cometh. And it's hard to get rid of it until, until you become lowly, until you humble yourself and submit yourself to the wisdom of God. Fearing God, keeping His commandments. Proverbs 13.10 Only by pride cometh contention. Why is there so much division in the body of Christ today? The pride of all these men online and the men in the Babel building system, their pride. When someone comes to them and corrects them and says, yeah, uh, You're saying, yea, hath God said. Chapter and verse on what you just said there. It sounds good. Don't get me wrong. It sounds good, brother. But where is it at in the Scriptures? Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. 1 Timothy 3, 6. Paul's talking to Timothy, a man in ministry. He says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Condemnation of the devil? What did we just read in Genesis 3, 1 through 6? What does Satan say? Yea, hath God said. Then he just flat out calls him a liar. He gets her to question what God said and then calls him a liar. Not a novice. What does a novice do? I just lost a lot of my papers in here. What does a novice do? He rests. That's another correction I had from a brother in Christ. I kept saying wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. And he said, it says rest. And I was like, you're right. It says rest. Rest the scriptures to their own destruction. A novice doesn't understand everything in this book. And I still don't understand everything in this book. But the point is, is when you come across something you don't understand, you pray over it. You study it. You compare scriptures. You keep reading it. And you wait for God to show you the truth. But sometimes you, do, you jump the gun and you try to, I don't get this. So I'm going to try it with my own intellect. I'm going to try to force understand my, uh, uh, my own understanding into this. And I'm going to try to make it say what, what I want it to say because I don't get what it's saying. So i got to act like I know what it's saying. So then you make something up and then you force the Bible to line up with what you're saying when it doesn't. Okay? You're a novice. And some of these novices have such pride and you correct and say, hey, that's not what that means. I've had brethren show me, hey, you kind of said this, but what, what, what about these verses over here will help better explain this? And I'm like, you're right. We can't be prideful, brother, says Christ. We've got to be able to take correction. We're not supposed to be above accountability. 
1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, remember all that's in the world? I forgot to leave, I forgot to go there. I'm sorry. The flesh, the lust of the flesh was the first thing that has pride. The other thing I left out was the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Be not conformed to this world, not to be a friend of the world. But more importantly, what I see among the brethren is loving the things of the world, or loving the world's way, the way the world wants to do things, instead of the way God wants to do things. And they start loving things in this world. The way they want to live their life becomes a lowercase g God. Their wives, their husbands, their children. If you remember the story of Eli, he got in trouble because he honored his sons above God. Okay, God needs to come first. His word needs to come first. There's people that uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games and satanic style music became lowercase g gods. Their sin and their wickedness, you shouldn't do them. But they chose them over the Lord and His word. And what gets them to really, I mean, the pride to the point where they kick brethren to the curb and stab them in the back and treat them, uh, just, just spit on them and, and walk all over them like they're nothing. It takes a lot of pride to do that. Okay? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. The devil's way is, yea, hath God said. A better rendering would be. We can improve on God's word. We can do things our way instead of doing things God's way. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. This novice starts acting like he's smarter than God. That he, he can be his own God and decide what's right, what's wrong, and what better rendering would be and, and everything. 1 John 2.16. Okay, John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. The pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, worldliness. I've seen it. Brother, when you try to quote scripture, I tried correcting some brethren when it came to lust of the flesh. I've tried to correct brethren when it comes to worldliness and idolatry. Things in your life are coming first. Your priorities are all messed up. God's not, and His Word's not coming first. The ministry's not coming second. And being a servant to your brothers and sisters in Christ isn't coming third. And loving the lost world by preaching the truth to them isn't coming fourth. There's things in this world that's way more important than those four things. There's some brethren that they're, you're accumulating things down here, and the things down here that you're accumulating, multiple properties, multiple vehicles, multiple toys, um, your lifestyle, how you like to live, you're getting so fixated on down here that you're not focused on what up there. You're not focused on the judgment seat of Christ. You're not focused on that blessed hope. You don't have your eyes on Jesus Christ. Pride. Pride is what really keeps you from taking correction. Ephesians 5.21 Ephesians 5.21 We read, Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. We're being subjection one to another. We're supposed to be there to exhort one another with this. Not worldly phrases and comforting worldly words and everything. No, with the Word of God, I've always said this, the best way you can encourage a brother or sister in Christ or exhort a brother in Christ or correct a brother or sister in Christ is through the Scriptures. It's the only way. It should be, you should have it in your heart that this is the only way. Okay. You don't bring the Bible down to their level. You bring them up to the Bible and say this is the way to do it. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, grace, when it comes to everlasting life at salvation, but there's also grace in this life. We've already talked about this um, by the terror we persuade men. Uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. You're saved. You're born again. Praise God. Now you've got to start looking towards Jesus Christ. You keep looking for that blessed hope. Looking, you're supposed to be working towards that judgment seat of Christ. Where we're all going to get judged. 
our life as a Christian is going to get judged. And you're supposed to be looking to it with fear. Lord, what am I doing wrong? Am I handling the word wrong for this study? Am I handling your word wrong? Am I saying things wrong? I get to praying and saying, Lord, it seems like we're doing good. And the next thing you know, i got a brother hitting me up. Check and verse on that. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I, I made a mistake again. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. Fix it. Right. What do we say? Take the correction, fix the problem, and move on. Don't wallow in your mistakes like in sorrow. Move on. Okay, Lord, I made a mistake. Help me to say it right from now on out. Help me to keep correcting myself. You correct me, Lord, through me, like your own Holy Spirit bearing witness with your conscience to help me correct. Okay, make sure I'm saying it right. It's not wrestle, it's rest the scriptures to their own destruction. Okay, rest. Okay, I need to say it right. Help me, O oh Lord. I have brethren that correct me. Praise God. Okay. Now, pride and worldliness slash lust of the flesh get in the way. But now, what is the proper way to correct someone? Do you yell at them? Do you yell at a camera? If you have a problem with a brother in Christ, because you see them doing something wrong or saying something wrong, you know what you need to do, brothers of Christ? You need to go to them and talk to them. Not yelling at a camera. Okay? I know some brethren, they like to yell at a camera. But losing your temper. Being sarcastic. Name calling. Mocking. Is that how you correct people? Well, once again, if you're a Brian, you're going to say chapter and verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of our Lord must not strive. If you're getting into name-calling and backbiting and whispering and bearing false witness and mocking, you're, you're, cause, you're, you're striving. You're trying to cause confrontation. You're trying to cause problems. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Like I said, the hardest ones is for the ones that you know they're lost, but they, they find they wait for you to make a mistake and they pounce. Or from brethren that have a that they're they're getting into the pride, and the pride is just it's hard. But we have to be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That's how we're supposed to correct people. Brothers of Christ, when you go to correct someone, make sure your heart's in the right place. It's not done out of pride or envy or hate. You shouldn't be in hate. You shouldn't have a hate for a brother or sister in Christ. But if you hold on to bitterness and you hold on to anger and bitterness, it'll end up turning into hate for someone if you don't give it to the Lord. Even if you're angry with the cause, you still need to give it to the Lord. Why? Because you need to be in meekness when it comes to correcting that brother, whether he's wronged you or he's wronged the word of the Lord. All right? You're still in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, that God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. There it is. That's our motivation. Why do you correct people? Why do I correct you, brothers and Christ? Why do I want your correction to me when it comes to making sure I line up with this book? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When you put this down... And you start straying from this, and you start saying, I can say things better, and I can do things better. That's when Satan and his ministers pounce. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil going around like a roaring lion, lion, seeking whom he may devour. Oh, look at that Christian. He put the Bible down. I can pounce on him. Oh, look at that sister in Christ over there. They're not sister, I'm talking about. That, look at that woman over there that's a godly woman. She put her put the Bible down. She's not praying. She put her Bible down. She's she's fighting the order of authority in here. I can pounce. I can pounce. I can pounce. Why do we correct each other? To keep you in line with the Lord and His Word. To also protect you from the enemy. When you start straying from the book, that's when the enemy comes in and starts um, encouraging where you're wrong. They start watering the bad fruit, the bad seeds. Because they want those to bloom, they don't want the good seeds to bloom. And then you have a brother or sister in Christ come along and say, "Where's the, a sister in Christ doesn't correct a brother, but a sister in Christ can say, uh, you said this, brother, where was that at again? I couldn't find it. Where is that at again? But she's not correcting. She's just asking, where is it? 
But the point is, is when someone, a brother in Christ comes along and says, hey, corrects you and says, you need to get back in line with this book, it's because they want the good fruit to show. They're watering the good fruit, the good seeds. All right? There's a way to correct brothers in Christ, and we need to correct this way. Right now, it is serious. In the body of Christ today, hardcore, is the, that spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, I'm, the title indoctrinated with, Yea hath God said, is so hardcore in the body of Christ that even I am falling prey to it even ten years later. Of studying this book ten years, and I'm going to keep studying it until the day I die, or until God calls me home, I'm still making mistakes. We need to be vigilant. Okay. There's a way to correct, and we need to correct the right way. A person that cannot see to say things God's way. People that can't. You correct them, you show them the truth. I don't care. I don't care. I want my free grace. I want, because they like to steal salvation. They just take it. God doesn't give it to them, because they don't have it. They have a, a counterfeit. They don't have salvation. they got a counterfeit, but they think they can just take salvation. Free grace. Faith alone. They, they, they use the term faith and alone together because they don't want repentance. They don't even want prayer. They just want head belief. A triune God. Trinity, rapture, second advent, church age, so on and so forth. When you deal with them, when you say, Hey, brother, you said you're a Bible believer. You said, Add thou not to his word, lest you reprove thee, thou should be found a liar. And there's a lot of other verses. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Thy words are pure words, a silver tried in fire seven times. This is perfect just the way it is. Why do you keep saying things that aren't in the Bible? And when you got people that are so hardcore, I don't care, I'm going to keep saying things my way. They're not taking the correction. Remember we said over here, um, they're not taking the correction, they're not fixing the problem, and they're not moving on. They're stuck in that hole that they're in. That hole of, yea, hath God said. That pit of, I can say things my way and I can do things my way. They're not taking the correction and standing for what the Bible actually says. John 8, 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Most of the people I come across that are hardcore against saying things the Bible way are false converts. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Hirelings. They call them hirelings, but people that are in it for filthy lucre's sake. Uh, making merchandise of you, love of money. They're in it for, the, the Bible talks about the Nicolaitans. They, they're in it for the power and control. They like to lord over the laity, you know. But they're not of God. Now, I understand, like I said, brethren can fall into a... a um, I've had brethren... I'm trying to think of examples, brothers. Uh, the Trinity situation where we start saying, okay, we need to start saying things God's way and get the world's way of saying things out and say things God's way. It's Godhead. I had a man that just was mean in the comment section, and I was trying to, I was trying to reason with him with the Scripture, saying, hey, we need to say things God's way. It's Godhead. Okay? And he's, oh, he'd get mad at me. He wants his trinity and everything. I planted some good seeds. He disappeared. Several months later, because I think it was his pride and that, res I didn't put this in the study, but the respecter of persons, I'm of him, so I have to defend him. But later on, a few months down the road, he came back and apologized and said, you know what, I spent more time in the Word and prayer, and you're right, that stuff isn't in there. I need to say things God's way, and I need to actually defend this book and stand for this book. You're not defending this book and standing for this book if you keep adding to it and subtracting from it. Oh, I say Trinity instead of Godhead. I say Church Age instead of Time of the Gentiles. I say the Great Tribulation instead of Daniel's 70th week or Time of Jacob's Trouble. I say Millennial Kingdom instead of the Kingdom of Heaven or the Day of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? You're not defending this book. You're attacking this book. John was isolated in the island of Patmos. You're not defending this book. You're attacking this book. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. You're not defending this book. You're attacking this book. When you say, thus saith the Lord, and he didn't say it, and you get vehement, I'm defending the Bible. I've come across people like that. I'm just, it's, 
They read that verse about the Trinity where it says these three are one. You have the Father, the Son, and, and, the, and, the, and the Spirit, or the, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And they say that's the Trinity verse. They'll keep saying that until, until the day they die. This is the Trinity verse. This is the Trinity verse. Chapter and verse where it's the Trinity verse. They think they're defending this book when they're attacking this book. Where does it say it? Okay. 1 John 4, 5 says, They are of the world, therefore speak thee of the world, and the world heareth them. You know all these sayings that, that, I, that we went through, did our, our so-called quickest Bible studies in the world, where, oh, we're done, because they're nowhere to be found. You know the world loves these sayings? They are of the world, therefore speak thee of the world, and the world heareth them. They love the idea of free grace. They love the idea of, that they can just steal salvation. They can take it. They don't have to come to God broken. They don't have to actually truly believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They just have to have the head knowledge. They don't have to confess both in prayer and ask God to save them. They can just take salvation. I've said this before. This free grace, this faith alone, which is basically a repentantless gospel, is popular in this world today. It is so popular. You know what's not popular? The true plan of salvation. Repentance towards God, which is coming to God the Bible says God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save such that be of a contrite spirit. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Sorrow towards God. For what? For all is sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. The law of sin and death. You've sinned against God, and now you're on your way to hell. You're just waiting for that final judgment. You're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, and that should break you. You should have sorrow for that. You should be sorry for sinning against God. You should have sorrow for your personal sins. That's true biblical repentance. Repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That true plan of salvation that's backed by tons of scripture is not popular today. In fact, it's hated the most today. These things up here, Trinity, it's popular today. Every false religion out there has Trinity. But we Bible believers are supposed to stand for the word of God. We, we're the Godhead. And the Godhead is God the Father and the person singular of Jesus Christ. There's only one person in the Godhead, and it's Jesus Christ. God the Father does not have a body, soul, and spirit of His own apart from Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit does not have a body, soul, and spirit of His own apart from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that has a soul, God the Father, that's in Him. I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. Philip says, show us the Father, and it suffices us. How long has thou been so long with me, and hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. He's the body of God. He's the image of God. Only in Jesus is there a body, soul, and spirit. You have to have all three to be called a person. Didn't mean to go off too much, but all these terms, they're popular with the world. The world loves these terms. The world hates what the Bible actually says. Remember that, brothers and sisters Christ. You can always tell when you're kind of getting off, when the world as a whole, all these false religions, they're saying, oh yeah, I love that, I love that part about him, I love this part about him. They are of the world, therefore speak thee of the world, and the world heareth them. Titus 3, 1. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. And meekness, uh, showing all meekness unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. One thing you got to remember, brothers and Christ, when you go to correct someone, remember, I remember a lot of the big mistakes I've made, where I gave in to the lust of the flesh and fought God for two years. And then to this day, I'm still struggling with the flesh when it comes to here, okay? God's gotten a lot of the physical stuff out of my life, but I still struggle and I have to say, Lord, forgive me of that thought, and I go back to where I left off with Him and start talking about the Word, start singing some hymns, quoting Scripture, go for a walk, 
For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. Maybe God hasn't shown, like I said, that brother in Christ, it took several months of, of, of me praying for the brethren, and you probably at the time, if you're following this ministry long enough, when it came to the Trinity versus the Godhead, when that brother got so mad and angry at me, I just prayed and said, Lord, I was wrong in some areas, and sometimes I was stubborn, but God opened his eyes, and you trust God, and you give them to God and let God deal with them. Sometimes we were deceived, for ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts. Sometimes you got some brethren that they, I've said this, I, I kind of being frustrated, I said that I, I need to be meek, but I said that they have the attitude that their poop don't stink. They start having this thing where they're, they're above everybody. They forgot where they came from. You know, that man that was fallen on his face, at Calvary, they'd forgotten that man. Now the old man dead and buried, yes, but I'm talking about when the new man comes in, they've forgotten how much God had to clean up their life. How bad things were, and God had a lot of work to do on them. They've forgotten that. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Brothers and Christ, we need, to, we need to have some grace and say, Lord, I preached the truth, I planted some seeds, now it's up to them. Now it's up to them. And I keep praying for them. I keep praying for my brothers in Christ that have stabbed me in the back. I keep praying for the brethren that I used to fellowship with and they just dropped off and just disappeared. Don't know whatever happened to them. That's why I'm grateful that we have this in these last days to Skype brethren and, and email and stuff, but I really wish we had face-to-face -face fellowship. It's harder to disappear when you live in the same town as one another, you know? And you can still be there to try to encourage the brother in Christ or sister in Christ. Okay? But on here, people have just disappeared. I've had brethren that stabbed me in the back. I still pray for them. I still sit there and say, Lord, I miss them. I miss my brothers in Christ that I used to fellowship with. There used to be a group that we used to do Bible study, my first Bible study group. And there was a group of us that got together. There was a couple up in California, uh, Can not California, Canada. Uh, and two or three of us that were around the world, and we all would come together and do Bible studies once a week. That group has been, has been like disbanded and just scattered. What happened? Pride. People made mistakes, and, and not being able to forgive brethren that make mistakes. Right here we just read where it's like, uh, for we ourselves also were sometimes, you forget where you came from. You forget, I always tell people, when you see a brother in Christ that has fallen so far, you, you, there's nothing left to do but to preach the gospel to them again. Not because you believe they're a false convert, but because they've forgotten why they got saved. Why they needed to get saved. Who it is that saved them, and who it is they serve. I know a brother in Christ that at this point, he can't tell friend from foe. He's stabbing brethren in the back. And kicking brethren to the curb. Yeah, you're not to fellowship with the lost world, and you're supposed to say, hey, I can't fellowship with you. But he can't tell the difference between saved and lost anymore. He can't tell the difference between free friend and foe, his pride, his ego. He's forgotten why he got saved and who it is that saved him. He's also, his ministry has become a business. A whole other thing. But Brother Jesus Christ, when you're correcting somebody, remember where you came from when you correct somebody. That's where the meekness comes in, Lord. I really didn't want someone yelling at me like anger and hate and bitterness and pride. Like, like I said, I still get correction from lost people that are so prideful and arrogant. I get corrected from brethren that I believe are prideful and arrogant. And then I get corrected from people that are in meekness. We still need to take the correction. When we're wrong, we're wrong. We need to get our life right. I want to keep saying it the right way that the Lord put me. Take the correction, fix the problem, and move on. All right? But we need to remember, we need to humble ourselves when we're correcting somebody. You correct them in meekness and out of love and a desire to see them recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, to see them get back up in a standing position. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. At his appearing, the judgment seat of Christ. At his kingdom, the great white throne. Okay. We're to preach the word. 
when it's actually in here, brother says Christ, work hard, work harder. I need to work harder. The biggest thing is you're still going to slip up sometimes because of that indoctrination of the yea hath God said, all these terms, all these words. are. It's going to take some work, especially if you're new to this channel and you're new. It's going to take some work to get back to saying things God's way, but we're commanded to, this is for a man in ministry, but when you're preaching, you're going to preach the word. When you exhort brethren, you exhort them through the word, you correct them through the word, you need to make sure it lines up with this book and it actually says what you're saying. We need to work harder. That's the whole point of this study, brothers and We need to work harder and we need to take correction without throwing a fit like a little two-year-old. We need to take correction. Verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Are we in out of season? When you've got them coming with like a million different titles and terms and everything that have no basis in Scripture, are we definitely out of season? Yeah. In these last days, it's harder to find people who will stick to this book as it is. It's very hard. Out of season. Reprove, rebuke, ex rebuke exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Long suffering and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You wanted people to be patient with you, long suffering. You want God to be long suffering, and He is. We need to be long suffering for people down here and be patient. Plant the good seeds, preach the truth. And then let God water. Remember, I've watered, I planted, Wallace, Paulus have watered, but God giveth the increase. I plant a seed, someone comes along and preaches the same thing, corrects that brother in Christ with the same thing. And the Bible says before, two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Two or three witnesses, let every word be established. When they get corrected by the second person on the same problem, that's them getting watered. That seed getting watered. But God's the one that gives the increase. And we're supposed to do it with doctrine. Now, there's doctrine all through this book. From, Gen uh, from the Garden of Eden all the way to Revelation. There's all kinds of doctrine throughout this whole book. But the doctrines that for us today you'll find in the Pauline epistles. Okay. Verse 3. Okay. And I always talk about this. The true plan of salvation you'll find in the Pauline epistles. I get frustrated because as a false convert in these Babel buildings, they'd always go to the Gospels. When, when Jesus is primarily preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And they'll grab verses from there, but they don't dare, they don't like grabbing from the Pauline epistles. People accuse me of being a Paulinian, yet I can turn around and say it seems like people are ashamed of the Pauline epistles, or they don't like the Pauline epistles. That's where we get the true plan of salvation, the Pauline epistles. That's where we get um, that in the time of the Gentiles, we're sealed into the day of redemption. These things that are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. That doctrine is for this time period. Only in this time period do we have, once you get saved, you're sealed. You can't lose your salvation. All right? Only in this time period. Uh, we learn about the Godhead. Godhead was there at the beginning to the to Revelation, but we learn about what the true Godhead is in this dispensation. We learn about dispensational teaching in the time of the Gentiles. We learn about it in this dispensation. We learn about the blessed hope. The day of Christ. The day of redemption. From the Paul. Those are the doctrines. Everything else is instruction and righteousness. And I might have left out a doctrine or two, but everything else is instruction and righteousness. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Remember 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think it is, it talks about how uh, there's a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. When the falling away happens first, because the falling away happens first, and that man of sin gets revealed, we get caught up. But there's people that aren't going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to start falling away from this book. They're going to start playing, get really into the yea hath God said. And there's some people that make a huge mess of this book, the Word of God. Because they want to push what they want. They want to make them feel better, make themselves feel better of living life their way and making the choices that they've made, and they try to get this book to conform to them. God is the potter, we are the clay. This is his word. We conform to him, not the other way around. 
But they won't endorse our doctrine. But after their own lusts, would we read up there? Um, but their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We talked about how one of the things that get in the way is lust of the flesh. For all the world, there's 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Here you've got people that, at their own lust, they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They don't like what I say if I line up this book. They don't like with this book. I don't want you defending me, brother, says Christ. Defend the book. Okay? They don't like this book. So they find teachers that tell them what they want to hear that go against this book. They don't want the true plan of salvation. So they'll go find teachers that teach free grace and faith alone and all that garbage. False gospels. So they don't have to come to God on His terms, His way. Teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Talking about teachers having itching ears. I lost brother to uh, a group of people that are claiming to be Bible believers that they're into Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games, and anime, which is just child porn, and worldly cartoons and satanic style music. And I tried to warn them, you need to get that stuff out of your life. And I lost them to these other men that, I don't, I don't even call them saved, these other men that are on YouTube that are saying, it's liberty. We, you can still do these things. It's just liberty. It's just liberty. I lost them to other teachers because those teachers told them what they wanted to hear. You can keep your sin. It's no big deal. And they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The Trinity is a fable. Triune God. You know, some of these teachings... There's no dispensation. That's a fable. There is dispensational. Paul talks about the dispensation of the grace that's given to me to you, or the grace of how it's dispensed today is not the same way it was dispensed in the Old Testament. How you find God's grace today isn't the same way as you find it in the Old Testament. It's not the same way in the time of uh, Jacob's trouble. If 1 Peter, I believe, is written to Jews for today, saved Jews today. And then when you get to 2 Peter, the first thing he says in 2 Peter, if I can remember, so I was going through this. I'm back into Matthew. I've gone through the whole Bible again. I'm back in Matthew, praise God. Keep going, brother. You get through the Bible, what do you do? You, you turn around and go back through it again. Oh, you got through it again, what do you do? You turn around and go back through it again. So the first letter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithyma, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe once you get through here, a lot of it lines up with today, First Peter. You can try to say, well, maybe both is for the time of Jacob's trouble. But one thing's for certain, when you get to the second Peter... The first thing he says is, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. First he's preaching, this is how it is in 1 Peter. Now you get to 2 Peter, he says, it's like our faith, but it's not 100%. He would have just said, hey, you're one of us. No, he said, it's like. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And you get in there that talks about how you can lose your salvation in, in 2 Peter. That's not for today. Okay. But fables. Okay. Be careful of fables. But watch thou. Here it is. But watch thou in all things. Watch yourself, brother Christ. Are you lining up with this book when it comes to your words? When you say, thus saith the Lord, the Bible says this is major doctrine, this is major Bible teaching, this is fundamentals of the faith. Is it actually in there? They shall turn away, uh, see, but watch thou in all things, endure affliction. I was talking to a brother in Christ. When you get saved, the closer you get to God, the further you're going to get from this world. The more you put this flesh down, the more you're going to be afflicted. The more struggles you're going to go through, the more hardships you're going to go through. The Bible says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
endure affliction. The closer you get to God and His Word and lining up with His Word, the more your flesh is going to fight you, the more the world's going to fight you, and the more Satan and his ministers, especially if you get popular, like you start get you know preaching and a lot more people are listening to you, the more people that listen to you, like on YouTube, I'm thinking, you really get attacked if you're popular. If you're nobody like me, you don't get attacked, attacked as much. But when I was lost, I didn't have I didn't I didn't have a struggle with the flesh because I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh. I didn't have a problem with the world, and the world didn't have a problem with me. The minister, the Satan and his ministers. Remember, it says Satan transforms himself into an angel of light because Jesus is the angel of the Lord, and he's the light of the world. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. He counterfeits Jesus, and no marvel for his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They never bothered me when I was lost. As a false convert, professing Christian, through faith alone, the free grace, easy believism, they never bothered me. The moment I truly got saved and born again, started studying this book, started hiding it in my heart, and I started living it and applying it to the life I'm living it, that's when they all came in and started attacking me. That's when life got really hard. It's not easy, brothers, says Christ. But that's where we get exhortation from the brethren, encouragement from the brethren. Prayer. Stay in the Word of God. That gives you encouragement. Just hardcore. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Stay in God's Word. It'll give you strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify him through thy word. Thy word is truth. I can do all things through Christ. Through his word. Jesus is the capital W word. This is the lowercase w word. Right. Endure affliction. Do the work of the evangelist. Remember, brother, says Christ, we're still here because we're, earn we're earning rewards in the judgment seat of Christ. But the other thing is we're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to be giving ammunition to the enemy to attack his word because we're not following it. Or we're misquoting it. Or we're adding to it and subtracting from it. That gives the enemy ammunition. I've known people that you can lose your testimony. When you start getting back into lust of the flesh and worldliness, I've lost my testimony with Brett, with people. Lost people. Um, Brothers says Christ, we need to line up with this book. You need to do the work of an evangelist. Our main goal as we're here is we're supposed to be a living witness first and foremost People say, oh, no, no, it's a verbal. No. Uh, I don't have the scriptures on me, but I was talking to a brother in Christ. It was talking about walk. Your feet are shod and you're walking. Your feet are shod with the preparation of peace. And it says you're walking with the gospel. And it uses the word walk. Walk is an action, not words. You're supposed to be a living witness first and foremost. You're supposed to shine with the life that you're living, saying, God saved me. He gave me this new life. He put me on the right path. I'm doing things His way. I belong to Him. And that's supposed to shine to the world. And the world looks at that and goes, I want what He has. Or they're going to go, I don't want Him around me. I don't want that light shining on my deeds, lest His deeds should be reproved. You know, the light, light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds be reproved. They'll either want nothing to do with you, or they'll want what you have. You're supposed to be a living witness first, and a verbal witness second. Today, they switched it around, and now you just... And, and like I said, phys, uh, you're supposed to be a living witness, and a verbal witness. They switched around. Now you're supposed to be a verbal witness first, then a living witness. Then they just take the living witness away and just say, you can just be a verbal witness. How many of you have dealt with people like that? They're all talk and no walk. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Remember, this is to Timothy, a man in ministry. When it comes to making full proof of thy ministry, do they line up with this book? Are they following 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing? Are they following this book? Is their heart in the right place? Is this in their heart? Uh -huh. So brethren, check yourselves and make sure that you line up with what the Bible actually says. And when you say, thus saith the Lord, 
this Bible doctrine, the Word of God says, the Word of God teaches, it's actually there. You need to brush up on this book and start your day with this book and end your day with this book. And I'm warning you, I even have this problem and I've struggled with it and it's that indoctrination of yea hath God said, a better runner would be, and it's coming in through philosophy, being spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You ask him, why do you say these things? Like the Trinity and, and this. Well, we always have done it. Our, the church fathers did it. Where the church? Because I remember getting into it with somebody with Trinity. I was like, the Trinity doesn't come from the Bible, so where'd you get it from? Well, if it's the Bible, it's there, it's basic. I said, no, it isn't. Chapter and verse. You show me where it says capital T, that God is capital T Trinity. I'll, 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 I'll uh, repent. Remember what we said? I will take the correction, fix the problem, and move on. I'll humbly repent and say, hey, okay, it's Trinity. Show me what's at in the Bible. They couldn't find it in the Bible. So I said, well, where do you get, where do you think they got it from? Church fathers. Traditions of men. Rudiments of the world. Where did the church fathers get it from? The Reformation. What's the Reformation? They wanted to reform Catholicism. They didn't want to do away with it completely. Which brings me back to where did the Reformation get it from? Catholicism. The Catholic Church. All right. Make sure it actually says it, brother says Christ. And when you make a mistake like I do sometimes, take the correction. Take the correction and make sure you line up with this book. Acts 17.10, this is the last part, Acts 17.10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica more noble. Why? And that they receive the word with all readiness of mind. Somebody who's truly saved and born again, when I first got saved, I received this with all readiness of mind. I couldn't get enough of Bible preaching and Bible teaching. And I think through a lot of those videos that I watched a million times, some of those, those teachers, they're godly men, there was good teachings, but they were saying things that weren't in the Bible, and I got indoctrinated through it. I started getting spoiled by it. Okay. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. That's why you always have the Bible open. You can pause the video and turn because I try to make these videos short as I can because I love scripture. I love going from scripture to scripture. But when you have people that are seeking the truth, notice it says that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They didn't say they believed. They said they received the word with all readiness of mind. And they search the scriptures daily whether those things are so. Those are key that need to be there when you're preaching to lost people. They have to have a love of the truth. They have to want the truth. We're not car salesmen. They don't want the truth. You planted some seeds, you move on. Brush the dust off your feet, move on to the next city. Why? Because verse 12, when you have the attitude of they receive the word with a ready mind, and they're going to search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. Back then they were searching the Old Testament when they were preaching Jesus. Verse 12, Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is supposed to be in this book. We're supposed to believe in the word of God. It's perfect just the way it is. And brother, it's Christ, I'll say it again, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, that there's an infestation in the body of Christ of the yea hath God said, a better rendering would be. And that indoctrination, Satan's been infiltrating the Babel buildings. I mean, you invite lost in, just come on in, Satan. Your ministers, just come on in. You invite both lost and saved in, and you didn't think that was going to cause a problem? So the indoctrination has come in, and they've gotten to the point where they have no problem adding to God's word and subtracting from God's word. It reminds me of Moses. We're not going to go there, but Moses. Remember when he comes down from the mount with the Ten Commandments and sees them doing their things, and he throws, uh, worshiping the calf, the golden calf, and Aaron had made him naked to their shame. He throws it down, breaks the Ten Commandments, and he looks at them and says, They that are on the Lord's side come unto me. Just a, we can do a whole other teaching on this, but God had me write this in real quick. 
they that are on the Lord's side come unto me. And I'm making this call out there because today you hear people say, them that are on Peter Ruckman's side come to me. Them that are on 33rd Book's side come to me. Them that are on Sam Gibbs' side come to me. Them that are on David Daniel's side come to me. Them that are on Brian Denlinger's side come to me. Them that are on Philip Newton's side come to me. I'm putting it out there. Them that are on the Lord's side come unto me. Brothers and Christ, we all need to come together on the Lord's side. And we need to actually start fighting for what the Bible actually says. I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. And remember that we did a long two hour study. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. There's other videos. But brothers in Christ, stick with the word. Start your day with the word, end your day with the word. Start your day with prayer, end your day with the prayer. You know, prayer and reading the word. Okay? This needs to be number one in your life. God and his perfect written word needs to be number one in your life. And don't let anything else get in the way of this. Because it will. It will. I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters Christ. Please pray for me. I will see you, brothers and sisters Christ, in the next study.